Well, um, it's always good to talk music with you, Ian. And it seems, in some respects, it only seems like yesterday when we were talking about uh, Mozart in Italy. Yet, in other respects, it feels like a, a lifetime away. Absolutely. I mean, professionally, it probably was almost yesterday. It was, um, it was early March, wasn't it? The 8th of March or something. It was. So, um, yeah, I, the, the following week, it just felt like every day the news got worse. I remember when I when I realised that concerts were going to be cancelled and people were saying, you know, no, no more than 500 people in any one place. I was full of the joys of, oh, it's fine, we'll just get together and record instead. You know? and, and then gradually the, the range of options diminished to zero. So here we all are in lockdown. Well, at least, at least we're just about to launch your recording so the Mozart's yeah. voice is not, is not hidden for... For much longer. So this is yeah. this is the first volume in I think a, a seven volume seven volumes, seven I think. volume series. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I haven't programmed all seven, but basically the premise is that each recording will have one of the six great Haydn minor key Storm and Drang symphonies, and the seventh will have the Mozart so-called little G minor, which always seems ridiculous, but the um, number twenty-five. Yeah. And then around that we'll program lesser known. Storm and Drang works. I mean, obviously, the first thing I think we need to do is sort of unpick, unpick the term Storm and Drang because it's yeah. even though it seems to have alighted on on music more than anything nowadays, that's not actually how it started at all. It was a, a literary movement. Yeah, and actually, I hadn't realised until quite recently it was only a, it was applied to music for the first time in 1909. Um, a scholar was writing about. Haydn for his the centenary of his death and just picked up the terminology of Storm and Drown um, and, and it sort of stuck and it's still you know reference books if it, most books on 18th century music if you look up Storm and Drang in the index you'll get you'll find quite a few references. Um, it has I think also been used uh, the, the fact that, that the play the Storm and Drang play by a, a guy called Klinger um, where the name comes from, was written in 1776. So I think there has been a trend recently for musicologists to sort of dismiss the whole idea because most of the music predates that. And uh, But I think the point is that, of course, it wasn't a deliberate conscious movement. That, you know, nobody sat down and said, right, I'm going to write a Storm and Drang symphony this morning. But I, but I think it was absolutely a current and, and actually, the more I've been, I, I wasn't really conscious of this when we did this first recording, but the more I've looked into it and the more I've thought about it, it does seem to me that there's a symphonic parallel with exactly the same operatic reforms that Gluck and Kaltzabigi were doing, um, that the Storm and Drang symphony movement um, was a very similar thing. I mean, the symphony was such a relatively new form and it seems increasingly clear to me that Haydn and then colleagues and contemporaries picked up on it, but I think Haydn primarily, was, was almost saying that he'd, he'd got in his early symphonies, he'd got to a peak of what a genteel Rococo sort of mid 18th century symphony could achieve. And I just get the impression that he was desperate for the range of ambition and the range of possibilities for a symphony to increase. So I think there's a real link um, from the middle period, Haydn, all the way through to Beethoven and beyond. And I, I increasingly think that it was this sort of wanting to be able, wanting music to mean more, wanting, wanting to be able to express more and wanting to demand more, both of the musicians and of the listener. Because it's, I mean, it, yeah. it, I, mean I was going to say, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the, the sort of the vehicle for expression in the, in the 18th century for so many composers was the was opera yet mm. Haydn kind of gave invented more or less and gave us the symphonic the symphony and if you follow his you know symphonic journey from you know number one right through to the end I mean it is an incredible development he made but it was almost as if that became the the medium for his expression yes he was an opera composer but for strange reasons you know he's never ever you know he's never really included in the sort of, you know, the inner sanctum mm. of the great opera composers. I mean, it's, it yeah. was the symphony for him 
that was his his sort of method of ex- expression and i guess you know the string quartet alongside that and then yeah. you know maybe maybe church music yeah but i think there's something interesting in that because i think temperamentally um and maybe technically as well as a composer he he seemed seems to have been much more at home in the quartet and the symphony and maybe it is to do with a sort of egalitarian sort of spirit that i've had the concertos and the operas there i mean the operas are beautifully crafted undoubtedly um but there is something about the idea of a lead role and a lead voice which the orchestra accompany and similarly with the concerto that he doesn't seem quite at home with whereas what i think we now marvel at with the quartets and the symphonies is the way a little nugget of a theme can be thrown around the orchestra or thrown around the four parts of the quartet. And I think that that seems to be what, what his great joy was. There's a wonderful, I remember reading an interview years ago with Tom Stoppard and um, he was saying that the reason why he wrote plays was because it was the most civilised way of disagreeing with himself. <laughs> and when he created different characters, he could contradict his, a, a point of view and, and you know, see more than one side of an argument. And I often think of that in terms of music and Haydn in particular, that, that a Haydn symphony or Haydn quartet is like the most civilised way of agreeing with ourselves. That you know, There's a wonderful way of, of a camaraderie amongst a group of players and the listener becomes implicit in it where, you know, just themes are shared and, and thrown around and mulled on and developed. Yeah, because, I mean, there's that the, the famous quote where he says, you know, it, we're talking about being stuck down in Esterhaza, that, you know, he was, mm. he was basically away from where it was all happening, so he was forced to be original. And, and that actually stands up very, very well when it comes to the string quartet and the, the symphony, because he just basically got on with it and turn yeah. these forms into, you know, these magnificent sort of voice pieces for himself. But maybe, maybe not being in the kind of thicket of it in Vienna or, or Mannheim or wherever it was happening, actually operatically, maybe he wasn't actually at the sort of cutting edge. And, mm. you, you know, in a way, his, his operas kind of lag, lag behind his other forms in that respect. Um, you know, he wasn't sort of forced to be original dramatically when he was being so original symphonically, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And also, I guess, there, by its nature, opera is more collaborative. So the moment you're presented with a libretto, you know, that, that's a, a substantial part of the thing. Whereas with a, I mean, one of the great things that he was able to do was, was to, you know, you can, someone mentioned to me the other day that the finale of the, um, Symphony Number no. Seventy, which doesn't have a nickname, so it's not done as often. But it's, it's literally just a bop, 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 just you know, four notes thrown off, and the whole movement is based on on that that one figure. And he always seems to take a thrill in the more he limits himself, the more fun he has with with the juice that he extracts from the fruit. So each of your um, each of the volumes in this uh, Sturm und Drang um, series is a kind of me- as you said it, it will each each volume will lead towards one of Haydn's uh, Sturm und Drang symphonies. But in a way, you're you're contextualizing them, and on this first volume, you're kind of leading up because you know you've got composers who you know are older uh, and been around longer mm. than Haydn, but who were obviously you know they were all in their own way getting to grips with this you know this movement this sort of um, zeitgeist in, in the musical mm. world that was encouraging them to make these uh, sort of dramatic um, expressions. I mean, how, how, does, you know, how would you actually characterise Sturm und Drang in music? I mean, what does it actually sort of sound like? What does it look like? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one because I, th- I think it was such, a, it, it became its own language. Um, and I suspect a lot of the composers probably didn't even consciously think oh, I'm going to do this or that. It, it just sort of evolved into a particular, it was almost like a craze, you know, one of these fads that, and, then, and certainly it passed almost as quickly as it arrived. There are, there are certain things um, that they all seem to have in common. Uh, I mean, things like um, use of unisons and unharmonized, strong, punchy, melodic figures. Um, both strong and and quiet, um, sort of extremes, extremes of dynamic, big, big contrast. Again, just trying to break moulds and stretch things. Big leaps, you know, from the bottom of an instrument's register to the top. 
a lot of tremolos and the strings so shivering. I mean, it's interesting that the, the literary movement talks about the goal of, of the literature being to inspire terror and fear in the reader or, or in theatre in, the, in the, the audience. And I think that's, that holds true for the music as well. Um, a lot of pregnant pauses and surprises. I mean, of course, Haydn did exactly the same thing in his comic music. Um, so he, he already had a sort of bag of tricks that was applied in a very different way. But I think generally it was these, these, these sort of techniques. Oh, and, and also um, syncopation, lots of ba ba ba, lots of sort of energised accompaniment figures. Because it does kind of, it does instill in its listeners a different kind of engagement with the music. It's not, you know, it's not the genteel court music that you could sit in your box or whatever, you know, and chat over you yeah. know this kind of was arresting you know and you would yeah. it would be very difficult not to concentrate you know exactly. on, if you listen to any of the record any of the pieces on on this on this first recording you know this is not something you could ignore, uh, ignore because it's kind of the musical equivalent of you know grabbing you by the lapels and giving you a good shake absolutely and i'm really glad you mentioned the idea of, of talking because i mean we know from the surprise symphony that that it drove Haydn mad the idea of people not paying full attention to his music. And it absolutely does seem to me that when he was writing these big statement minor key symphonies, that he was demanding that the audience shut up and listen. Um, and that does seem like a, a big change. And, you know, presumably a lot of the early symphonies that he was writing, they would have been performed to, I don't know, 20, 30 aristocrats in the room. So, you know, they, they probably were talking about other things and not particularly engaged. Um, so I think there is very much a sense of, of arresting and, and really just wanting to up the ante and, and make the music intense and just mean much more and, and grab attention. I guess the, the Gluck um, ballet of the um, Don Juan, which is actually what we begin the first disc with, the finale of that, and that is often cited in the books that you read as, as the birth of, of Storm and Drang. And actually in this case, I think it probably is. I mean, it has all the trappings, all, all the, the technical things I was mentioning just now. They all seem to have it, have it in that sort of five minutes of music. And it is, it must have totally shocked the audience when they, when they first heard it. There are th three other composers who, we, we're starting to hear, hear their music a little bit more. I mean, I'm talking about Yomeli, Beck and uh, Traeta. Um, you know, there are a few recordings of, of these. I mean, Yomeli was clearly a, a very important composer at his time. I mean, an enormously um, prodigious composer. I mean, you know, absolutely loads of operas he wrote. I mean, he was based in Naples. Um, big, big figure, I think, in the, in the history of opera. Yeah, and very much what I, I, um, <laughs> I was surprised and quite pleased as a couple of years ago, I turned on Radio 3 and there was some music playing and I, for the first time, was able to recognise it as Yomeli. I I'm sure that's Yomeli, and I stayed and listened, and it was. It was Joy T. Donato who had recorded some. And I, so he is starting to get known. But he is one of those composers like Berlioz or Wolf, where however much you get into the idiom and the particular accent of language, you never quite know what's coming up over the page. <laughs> you can be totally mm. startled by a, a sudden change of direction. Um, and it's very idiosyncratic, it's quite unpredictable, quite sort of gothic in a literary sense, um, and, and very sort of very heart on the sleeve and very, very creative and imaginative, harmonically very interesting. Um, and I love it. It's interesting that, you know, all those adjectives you've used for, you know, to describe your melody, you could actually apply to Beck. Because, I mean, listening to his symphony, he's, you always, he, to me, he sounds a little bit like a composer in the 19th century like Franz Beerwald, who absolutely did his own thing. And is, is, is really nothing like anybody else. Um, and so sort of far ahead of his time. And Beck, you just listen to things and you think it's almost as if his music was looking over the tops of Mozart and Haydn to, to, to some, of the, some of the things that Beethoven did, you know. Completely uh, agree with you. I, I think, many, many years later. Yeah, I mean, the, the G minor symphony that we recorded uh, for this disc 
was published in 1762, so you know, nearly 40 years before Beethoven's first symphony. And it does absolutely feel like it, it looks forward to that. And I, I recently was sent a catalogue of the, um, the music library in Bonn, uh, which is a really interesting insight into Beethoven's childhood introduction to music. And because we know that he played the viola in the Bonn orchestra during, during his teens. And the first thing I did was to flick through this alphabetical catalogue to find out what Beck they had in the library. And they, they had over 200 symphonies in the library. And to my great disappointment, they didn't have a single symphony by Beck. So I, I, was, I was ready to say, yes, look, he, he heard this music and copied it, but not, not at all, he didn't know the Beck. Um, but it does absolutely feel, it, it's, it's got a real, it packs such a punch. And the, and the other thing I think when you when you hear the music, what, you completely somehow forget the fact that it's it's essentially an orchestra for strings and two horns, and it sounds like a full nineteenth century yes. orchestra. It's just such an amazing full sound. Um, I, for me, it's the great discovery. I mean, I I hadn't conducted the piece before before we recorded it, um, and I, I came across it a few years earlier. But it, I, I think it's a wonderful piece. And I think that's another interesting thing with the Schumann Grand, that a lot of the minor composers, relatively, um, all seem to have given of their best. You know, anyone that wrote a G minor symphony somehow seemed to tap into something that, I don't know whether there's something about the tonality that enabled them to give of the best or whether it was just, I mean, I guess as I was reading recently, someone had written that, you know, the, the very act in the 18th century of deciding to write a, a minor key symphony was in itself a statement. So, so, you know, maybe when you did sit down to write one, you, you were conscious that it, that it had great, a greater weight of, of possibility. And of course, it, it, it adds to the sort of Sturm and dranginess, if one can say that, you know, <laughs> yeah. of, the, of the sort of expression. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so, it, it's, it's visceral. It's, it, to me, I mean, I, again, one of the things that, um, that is sometimes mentioned with Sturm und Drang is that it's, it was related to a revival of, of interest in Shakespeare, and particularly the tragedies. And to me, the pieces like the Beck, uh, in exact musical parallel with King Lear screaming his head off in the heath. And, and, I, and again, it links to the quote that you mentioned of Haydn sort of in isolation being forced to be original. Um, and it, yeah, it struck me the other day, you know, this is, <laughs> here we are now, this, this is music for isolation. You know, I, I think um, it probably is, Haydn was probably tapping into something when he said he, he probably wouldn't have written such music if he'd have been in the centre of Vienna. And then, of course, the last, you know, the, the, the kind of climax of this, this volume is um, the, the Symphony Number no. 49, of course, another key, sim another minor key symphony, um, given mm. the nickname La Passione, which it's always a tricky one to know why it was called that. I mean, it's, it's based in the old, on the old church form, so it's got a, a long, slow movement to open and I mean that that could perhaps be why why it's it's you know passion music it's intense yeah. possibly spiritually possibly a sort of sacred utterance but nobody really knows no I, I mean I, I yeah I'm sure it is passion with a capital P I think it's you know it's it's Easter related rather than emotion related yeah but of course having said that it, it has an incredible emotional weight um, and it, it's the only one of the Storm and Drang symphonies that does follow that old church sonata style with an entire opening movement, a slow movement. Um, I mean, that's an incredible statement, you know, in a symphony to start with a slow movement. I mean, it really, I mean, it must have been quite a surprise, I would imagine, when it was first heard, because you know, yeah. that's not kind of how everyone expected a symphony to start. You know, they usually started by, you know, upbeat, loud, fast, uh, but this yeah. is anything but that. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's so profound and contemplative and, and it just just unfolds in its own way. And it, interestingly, I, I, I'm not sure, um, but I don't think there's been a recording of the symphony that has done both repeats in the first movement. And, and we did do both repeats and it makes the first movement 12 minutes or something. And I, I, 
even as recently as three years ago, I probably wouldn't have had the nerve. Um, but there is some, something rather good about recordings in that if I, I increasingly feel that if a composer marked a repeat, we should do it. I, I remember years ago doing a masterclass with the wonderful George Hurst, and he came out with a, a lovely line, which I have hung on to ever since. Um, which is, he, he said, if it's too boring to do twice, it's too boring to do once. <laughs> and I, I think there's, I, I love that idea. Now we should talk about the, um, the, the, the vocal uh, contributions to this album, because it's, um, you, you've got one of my favorite young singers, Chiara Skerat, who I think is absolutely sensational. I mean, she's so yeah. sensational here. I mean, this is amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And we, we had a great time with the, the first of the Trietta arias. Um, was I discovered after after selecting it um, quite a you know talk of the town for a while because in the score in one aria the, the one that we recorded um, he specifies that the voice needs to scream and um, and it it's absolutely again it it, it typifies for me I think what the whole storm and Grand thing was about it was wanting to break down bar barriers it was wanting music to be something more than a sort of beige background um and and really grabbing the attention so are the, there are these two places where the voice is the singer is prescribed to scream and we we tried i think Cara was saying the other day she tried 20 different and I, I think she didn't think that we would have the nerve to include it in the disc so when we sent her the final edit she said you kept the scream I said, of course we did it's looking ahead to the, the sort of rest of the series even though you don't quite know where it's sort of ending i mean there must be some some exciting discoveries that lie ahead well lay ahead for you and clearly lie ahead for us as the as the listeners yeah, definitely. I mean, of, of the pieces I already know, of the lesser known pieces, there's a wonderful G minor symphony by Kozulu, uh, a Czech composer who came to Vienna. The Krauss C minor symphony that he wrote in Vienna um, is an extraordinary piece, really. So th those two, I'd say, were my top ones. Um, the composer that copied Haydn most, I think, was Van Hal, who played famously played string quartets with yes. Mozart and Haydn in Vienna um, and he wrote over probably about a dozen minor key symphonies if not more and um, the second volume includes a D minor symphony by him and will will probably include one or two others by him as well they're, they're very good pieces so yeah and it's lots, also lots it's also discoveries. nice it's also nice to you know instead of having these kind of Everest works actually to see that you know they are part of a mountain range and actually there are, yeah, there are a few yeah. peaks around them that are you know not a lot, lot lower down you know it's yeah. it's that's that's nice to see that you know Haydn isn't you know on his own that actually he's surrounded or Mozart or Beethoven they're all part of this this incredible sort of um, I don't know geography of, yeah. of, of, of great music and yes and, and without you know the lesser masters the great masters wouldn't be kind of up there you know you kind of need exactly. this sort of perspective to put them you know put them into context definitely and also what's rather wonderful is that you do then realize that you know i mean so often mozart is talked about sort of up, up there on the pedestal he's absolutely a, a product of his age and of course yes. you know he would he would borrow and steal and copy um and improve on what he was copying and annoy everybody by doing it but it, it, absolutely, he was a product of his age. And when you when you come across a people a, a piece like the Beck Symphony, you do realise it's not just a case of placing a piece that's not as good as the Haydn, just so that you can see how good the Haydn is. It's just a, a slightly different. And I mm. think that the idea of a mountain range is exactly right. You know, it it it, it may not be quite as much of a peak as the Haydn, but it still has has the same sort of extremities of contour and the same thrill that you you know you you, you can still get some amazing views i guess to, yeah to murder the analogy <laughs> <laughs> well it's been really a pleasure speaking to you albeit sort of you know at a at a quite a a distance me in gloucestershire you in london but yeah. um let's hope that uh, before not too long that we'll be able to actually hear live music again and, you know, and, and share in these amazing discoveries together because uh, this yeah. is a, certainly a, a series that I'm, I'm looking forward to following, not just on 
on disc or streamed or downloaded, but actually it was, our, as it were, in the flesh. Yeah, thank you. Now, I, I do feel that, if nothing else, you know, the one positive thing of this is that I think we very quickly have realised, I'm sure we all knew it really, but the value of and the importance of live music making is... Yeah, definitely. You know, it's, I mean, I, I've found myself going onto YouTube and digging out, you know, biography uh, uh, programs on um, Carlos Kleiber and people. And it's, it's wonderful. You know, there's so many hours of things to keep us, you know, entertained and diverted and educated and uh, inspired. But, but actually, at the end of the day, the, the live music making is, is what we are now really starting to crave, I think. Yes, definitely.